our prayer. For we pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be, hallowed be thy name. The name that is above all names, Jesus. The name at which sins are forgiven. The name at which bodies are healed. The name at which relationships are restored. In some glad day, we will bow down and worship you face to face. And every knee will, con will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is indeed Lord. And God, as we meet together today in this chapel, we are desperate for you, lost without you. And how wonderful it is that your Holy Spirit pursues us, engages us, loves us, challenges us, walks with us, cares deeply for us. What an awesome God you are. Father, as we meet together today, we confess that oft times we have fallen short of what you have for us, and we ask for your forgiveness today. Thank you, God, for the freedom that we have in you. For in Jesus Christ, you lift the things of our past that are not pleasing, and you just lift them off from us and throw them as far as the east is from the west. And we are so grateful. Today, Father, we're aware of members of this community who are desperate in need for you physically. We think of Taylor and James, who's having a heart calf today, and Anna and Jeanette. And God, we ask that you would touch them as only you can, minister to them. And today, Father, as we continue to pray, we pray that your spirit would be so real on this campus this campus that was dedicated to you over a hundred years ago. And we pray that your spirit would be free to roam about in each and every dorm on this campus and each office and each, among each faculty member. God, have your way, we pray. And so today as we worship you, Father, we humbly come and we ask God that you would speak through this, your servant, Dr. Freimeyer, as he comes, give us ears to hear and a heart that beats passionately for you and feet that are willing to go wherever you deem necessary. <laughs> so bless us, continue to bless us as we continue to worship you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> I'd like to introduce uh, our speaker today and following that, there's going to be a reading and uh, the message. Dr. Freimeyer received his BA, his MA, and his MDiv, all from this hallowed place that we are here today. He received his PhD in practical theology from Fuller Theological Seminary, where his dissertation focused on creating sermons, the use of imagination, creativity, and novelty in preaching. We're going to have a good preacher today. <laughs> Dr. Freimeyer is currently on sabbatical from Asbury Seminary. We've been hearing a lot in the news and on Facebook about what God is doing in that great place. He serves there as associate professor of preaching, and he served Church of God congregations in North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Florida, Indiana, and California. Married for almost 48 years, uh, he and his wife, Joni, have three sons, all of whom are in pastoral ministry in the Church of God. And Jeff and Joni are spending this semester on campus, and he's teaching a course on homiletics. And he's enjoying writing and researching and engaging with students. We're honored to have you on campus. And uh, one thing I do know about Dr. Freimeyer is that he loves the Lord deeply. And uh, we are honored to have him. And uh, in just a moment, he will come and share the message. But first, 
there is a reading that we are to enjoy. Thank you, Dave. Before my uh, compatriots come, I think it imperative for me to thank uh, Dr. Willoughby. This is a bucket list experience for me to be here teaching this semester at this place. Uh, so much of my life and my formation happened here. Joni and I met here. My son, Jonathan, got married here in this chapel. I, I should have brought a picture along to compete with uh, Brother Johnson and his. <clears throat> but I want to thank uh, Nathan for his graciousness. He and Jamie have been incredible hosts. Thank you, Jamie, for all that you have done to make this such a wonderful experience so far. I also would be remiss if I didn't thank Dave and Greta Reams uh, for being the deans of this chapel, the directors of this chapel. That's uh, something I've done for 10 years at Asbury in Orlando, dean of the chapel there, so I appreciate the work that they do and the, uh, the work that goes into that. Dave commented to me last week that he didn't think it was a coincidence that this week, while all the news is coming out of Asbury, that six months ago he invited an Asbury professor to preach in chapel this week. I make no claims on that, but as someone who is Excited about how the Lord leads, I do take note of it. I hope you will too. I've asked some friends to join me in helping me with the reading. Uh, Kimberly Wooten is a student of mine in my preaching class. She's an undergrad here. And Dr. Uh, Leanne Ketchum is a colleague and the professor of preaching and practical theology here at the seminary and at the school. I've invited them to come help me with this, um, this scripture reading because it's about the Lord's Prayer and I have some concerns. So this morning we're going to share in the Lord's Prayer from scripture. I'll be sharing from Matthew 6, 9 through 11. And I'll be sharing from Luke 11, verses 1 and 2. So let's begin with the background. In Matthew, Jesus is teaching the crowd not to be hypocrites, but to pray in anticipation of God answering your request. Um, actually, in Luke, Jesus has just finished teaching the crowds, and the disciples ask him to teach them how to pray. That's not quite how it went. Uh, actually, that's exactly how it went. Well, come on, let's, let's, not, let's not argue um, about this during the scripture reading. Why don't we just pray the Lord's Prayer uh, together? Hear the word Lord of the Lord. Lord. Father, Father in heaven, be your name. hallowed be your name. Your kingdom your come. Your kingdom come. Give us each your day our daily be bread. Your done on earth as it is For, in heaven. Forgive um, us our stop, sins. Stop, For stop, we... stop, 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 stop. Why don't we try this a little different way? Uh, let's begin with Matthew. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Good. Now, now, Luke, you start, same opening. Father, hallowed be your name. You, um, you missed a part. W which part? The in heaven part. Right. It, it says, our Father in heaven, yeah. hallowed be your name. No, it doesn't. It doesn't? It doesn't? No, it just says, Father, hallowed be your name. Well, what about, the, what about the next phrase? Well, it says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Oh, boy, here we go again. My version says, your kingdom come. That's all? Nothing, nothing about God's will? I mean, I'm looking, but that's all it says. Are you sure this is the same prayer? It really doesn't sound like it. Let's, let's just try and get through this one time, okay? Matthew, please continue. Give us today our daily bread. Give us each day our daily bread. <sighs> now we're on target. <laughs> quick, quick, let's keep going. And forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that, who sins against us. Close enough, let's go on. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. 
And lead us not into temptation. No deliverance from the evil one? No. No, Figures. nothing else. Not a... Figures. Okay, let's just finish this up. You know, finish. <laughs> you know, the finish. <laughs> For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. You know, amen. That, the, the finish. Finish it up. No? You, you mean there's no kingdom, no power? Not here. No glory, no forever? No, nothing. Hey. All right, all right. Then just get the last word in. Let's finish it. Um, we are finished. Yeah, me too. No amen? Don't you end a prayer with an amen? I mean, shouldn't you end a prayer with an amen? Yes. Well, probably, but that's not what Jesus taught his disciples. Oy it's vey. not how Jesus taught the crowds either. I think I'm more confused than when we started this. How about you two? I am. Yeah, me too. What now? This is the, the word, word of, God of God for the, the people, people of God. God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. 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 Well, obviously, <laughs> we've got some problems here. I think we have some problems in how we understand the Lord's Prayer. And those problems, I think, are significant. We've come to grips, we have to come to grips, I think, with the reality that there are certain things about the Lord's Prayer that we don't fully grasp. And part of the reason we don't grasp them is that they make us a little uncomfortable. For instance, it's obvious from the reading, I think, that there are serious textual variants between Luke's version and Matthew's version. And while they can be reconciled, they aren't the same. There are also differing contexts, if you noticed. Matthew's context is that Jesus is teaching this prayer to the crowd. It's part of his corpus of teachings. It's, it's part of the, um, the Sermon on the Mount, that, that three-chapter section where Jesus is talking about the things that make up his basic preaching experience over his three years. But when you get to Luke... <laughs> Luke's taking the disciples off by themselves, and they're the ones that are inquiring of him how to pray, a little frightening that they don't know how. And what they're observing is that Jesus spends an awful lot of time in prayer, and they don't. So he asked them to teach them about this discipline of prayer and to open up something of his deep deep prayer life. There are also liturgical differences. There's a third version of this. That's the one we all memorized, right? It's the one we recite. It's not in Matthew. It's not in Luke. It's just the one, you know, we recite. It's not what Jesus teaches to his disciples. It's not what Jesus teaches to the crowd, at least not exactly. I, I think it's even named incorrectly. This isn't the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is in John 17. If you want to read the Lord's Prayer, that's really where he prays about the situation. This is either called the model prayer, probably the better name for it. Certainly referred to that in Matthew. And it's called the disciples' prayer in the Luke version. So what exactly do we have here? A problem, a conundrum. What's the meaning of the Lord's Prayer? Or at least, what's the meaning of what we call the Lord's Prayer. It gets even more complicated. Aren't you glad he came to chapel today? It gets even more complicated. Do you know that much of this prayer is not original with Jesus? Uh, there are some ancient prayers, Jamie. There are some ancient prayers that Jesus draws from. One is called the Kadesh. On the left side is the Kadesh, exalted and hallowed be his great name in the world, etc., etc. On the right is our Father which art in heaven, you can see that there is a similarity in wording. The Kadesh is one of the oft-repeated prayers that Jews do. It's not just the Kadesh, but there's also something called 18 benedictions. 18 benedictions has, Forgive us, our Father, for we have sinned. Pardon us, our King, for we have transgressed. 
citing similar language that's there. In addition to that, Jesus complicates this model prayer further by addressing God in a most unusual way. He addresses him as Father. Now, it's not unknown in Jewish tradition for God to be addressed as Father, but it is unusual. It is not common. And it's not the way in which those in the Old Testament would have addressed God in prayer, particularly. Nothing about this model prayer, nothing about this teaching prayer is as it seems to be. Even more than drawing from the Kadesh or from the 18 benedictions, the model prayer is drawn most significant from the very life of Jesus himself. It's actually drawn, I believe, from the most significant event that happens in Jesus' life up until this point. This event, if Jesus were to rank it, I think, would be the third most important event in his life. I think, obviously, the cross and the resurrection would be first and second in whatever order you choose to put it. But third would be the 40 days he spent in the wilderness, concluding with this temptation from Satan. I think in many ways that experience, that whole confrontation, is what forms Jesus' theology and understanding of what it means to be human, fully human, and experience the temptations that we as humans experience. That event so impacts Jesus that he ends up modeling this model prayer after the temptations that he experiences in the wilderness. You can note some of the parallels. For instance, the first temptation that Satan does in the wilderness is to tempt Jesus to take these stones and turn them into bread. After all, he hasn't eaten for 40 days. He's hungry, he's starving, and God has not provided anything for him to eat. And so Satan says, go ahead, just fend for yourself, turn the rocks, the stones into bread. And Jesus replies that we shall not simply exist by bread alone. Is it any wonder then when he's forming this model prayer, Jesus is deeply concerned that we will be tempted at those points and places where we feel a desperate sense of weakness, particularly as it comes to the basics of life. And so he includes in his prayer, give us this day our daily bread. The second temptation is the one where Satan takes him up on a pinnacle, on a high place so that he can see out across all the kingdoms of the world and then says to Jesus, these kingdoms can be all yours. You can have your own kingdom. All these kingdoms will bow down to you if only you bow down to me and worship me. Jesus replies that he will not and that he will worship God only. And so as he's forming this model prayer, he puts in place the words, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I think he's reacting to the temptation to have the kingdoms at his feet. The third temptation the third temptation is that he should throw him down, himself down from this high place, that he can save himself in this desperate kind of suicidal attempt. Jesus' reply is that you don't put your Lord God to the test. And so when he's modeling the prayer, he says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I wonder what this says about prayer. What are we to do to discern about Jesus' teaching on prayer if this is modeled after his own life experience rather than some theological or liturgical concept? It's not a laundry list of wants, of needs, and desires. Prayer is something different than all of that. This prayer comes out of the lived life of Jesus. It comes out of the real struggles, the human experience, the realities of seeking God for everything in our lives. And he says, that's the thing that you pray about. You pray about that desperate need that only God can fill. And then 
Jesus takes this prayer to a different level by how he addresses God. This prayer is designed for intimacy, intimacy with God. I think that's probably a better definition of prayer than I can come up with. Prayer is intimacy with God. Jesus does this because he does not address God as Yahweh. He doesn't address God as Elohim. He doesn't address God as Jehovah. He doesn't address God as El Shaddai, Lord God Almighty. He doesn't address God as El El Elyon, Lord Most High. He doesn't address him as Jehovah Nisi, Lord My Banner. He doesn't address him as Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that heals. He doesn't refer to him as Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. He doesn't refer to him as Jehovah Shalom, the Lord of Peace. He doesn't refer to him as Jehovah Shabbat, the Lord of Hosts. Jesus addresses God as Pater. Father, a term of deep intimacy. Is that how you address God? With intimacy? Or has our Father simply become another title? We don't enter into prayer, it's a misnomer. We don't enter into prayer. We enter into an intimate relationship with the author of everything. Imagine that. The God who created all things, who created everything that surrounds us, who created you and me and all of us, invites us to sit down in an intimate setting and have a personal one-on-one -on -one conversation with him. Oh, my God. Prayer is about intimacy. One of the definitions of pater is the one who has infused his own spirit into others. It's he who actuates and governs our minds, our whole being. Prayer is powerful, not because of what we say. Oh, come on. I've heard some people stumble through prayers, stumble to try and find the words to pray. And their prayers have moved me, not because of what they say, but because in whose presence we are when we pray. I think that's what's happening in Wilmore. I've spent some time over the past week talking with some of my colleagues on campus about what's going on there. They, to a person, say they can't really describe it. I think that in itself may be a sign of something special. Uh, Kimberly, who read the part of Matthew, took some friends and they spent about 24 hours or so in Wilmore this past week and I asked her to describe it in class, and she couldn't. At least she couldn't do it justice. I thought about asking her to give a testimony today, but I was afraid she couldn't give it justice here either. Because it's not something you describe, it's something you experience. It's like prayer. Prayer is not what you describe as prayer. Prayer is what you experience when you pray. There are so many powerful things going on in Wilmore, it's, it's not planned, it's not controlled, there's nobody in charge. The presidents are not in charge. The deans of the chapel are not in charge. Matter of fact, no one's really in charge. It just kind of passes around as the spirit moves. It harkens back for me to the greatest invocation prayer I ever heard. Greatest invocation prayer I ever heard was when an elderly retired pastor ascended to the pulpit to do the invocation prayer and prayed this prayer, Dear God, please do something today that isn't in the bulletin. What if God were in charge? 
What if our intimacy in prayer was such that instead of having a one-on-one -on -one conversation in this intimate setting, that all of creation, that others, that hundreds, even thousands might be invited in to share that table in intimacy together with him. Dr. Tim Tennant is my boss. He's the president of Asbury Seminary. He said he's been there both morning and evening every, every day. They've decided not to close classes, but to encourage students to continue to attend. Apparently, that call has been successful. They started out in Hughes Auditorium on the Asbury uh, University campus. Uh, Asbury University is right across the street from Asbury Seminary. They then had to move to an overflow auditorium at the college. They then had to move to the chapel at Asbury Seminary, and now they've moved to a second chapel at Asbury Seminary to handle the crowds. And the crowds that come at points are more than 100 to 200 waiting to get in. Dr. Tennant says, I don't think I'd call this a revival. And I think he may be right. He said, what I would call it is a spiritual awakening. What if we're living in the midst of a spiritual awakening? Not where it's programmed, but where the Spirit of God takes over and does what only God can do. If you want to understand what that is, that's prayer. That's when you enter fully into prayer. When you don't have the agenda to tell God what he should do, often what we do in prayer, right? But instead, we enter into the presence of God and we are there, we exist, we fellowship. We have our meaning and being affirmed and understood. It's what worship ought to be. Worship is a prayer. Mick will tell you that. Worship is a prayer that we pray. But we can't pray that prayer if all we do is read the words on the screen. We have to enter into the experience, not only of worship, but we have to enter into the intimacy of our connection and relationship with Jesus Christ himself and let the Spirit have full control. Can I get an amen on that one? Dave, can I have that chair over here? I have a little bit of a sense of what this whole experience might be like. Thank you, Dave. I was a junior in high school in 1970. Yeah, go ahead, figure it out. You can do the math. I was a junior in high school in Gloucester, New Jersey. And they came over the loudspeaker, and they had an unannounced convocation for all the students. So we went to the auditorium. There we heard some singing from some college students that were traveling. A couple of them shared a few general things. And then at the end, one of the students said they were going to be at a local United Methodist church that night, and anybody that wanted to come was invited. It was an unusual convocation, last minute. And the subject was unusual, so I went off to chemistry class with Mr. Hetherington, who was quite a dynamic person and was well-loved by, by most every student. We went in, and Dr. Hetherington said, I want to let you know that I am a deacon at the church that you're being invited to from that convocation, and I would like to second that invitation. After class was over, I asked him where the church was. He told me, and that night I went to the church. They sang some songs, they shared some testimony. I don't really remember much about the service. I was not very religious at all at that point. I was a very lax Episcopalian. I had been catechized, but didn't go. I was part of the CE crowd, you know, Christmas and Easter. And that was about it for us. We didn't do anything at home. I didn't read a Bible. I didn't even know have a Bible or know where one was in the house. So a lot of it went over my head. I didn't know it. I didn't understand it. But after it was over, I got talking with one of the students who I'm sure led me to the Lord. But you couldn't have told that to me. I didn't understand the language and the expression. He prayed with me. I'm sure he prayed that I would be saved. I didn't know what it all meant. And so all I knew was that something was stirring in me. And I didn't know what to do with that. So next Sunday, I went back to the Episcopal Church. I went for about a month. 
uh, which was the longest I went at any point during my teenage years. But unfortunately, it was a dead church. Everybody's got them. It happened to be the church, uh, the Episcopal church in my town was just a bad church. And it was dead. And so after a month, I faded away. But something kept stirring in me, but I couldn't figure out how to get it quelched. That fall, I ended up uh, helping a local church, a local church of God in town. George Scramstead was the youth pastor there. <coughs> and he was doing a youth musical called Tell It Like It Is, one of the very first that was ever done. But everybody in the youth group wanted to be in the musical, and they need somebody to do tech. So he went to the high school and hired the, uh, the, the tech team from the, high, from the high school to be his tech team. And I was on the tech team. And so I started going to some of the rehearsals. And there was this cute little redhead that was in the group. You know, this is a youth group evangelism. You all understand this, right? <laughs> her name was Vivian Barrett. Some of you know her as Vivian Kaufman. Passed away just a little bit ago. Viv invited me. We caught eyes with each other, went out. She invited me to church. I went to church and uh, had a different kind of experience than my Episcopal upbringing. Went to church and <laughs> At the, end of the, at the end of the sermon, and I probably hadn't heard more than two sermons in my life, because we went to the communion service at the, the Eucharistic service at the Episcopal Church. Nobody preached, so one of the rare sermons I ever heard. After it was over, I'm, uh, they, uh, they come up and somebody's singing, and uh, he's inviting people to come to the altar. Well, I'm a good Episcopalian. You go to the altar to get communion every week. So they invited people to come to the altar. I went to the altar. So I'm kneeling there at the altar, and I know if I'd had eyes in the back of my head, everybody's going. <laughs> if somebody had come up and put their arm around me and prayed for me, I probably would have been scared to death, but they didn't. And I prayed and went back to my seat. And then on the way out, I told the pastor. The pastor asked me, he said, how'd you like the service? I said, well, I don't know if you'll think this is much of a compliment, but that's the first worship service I've ever been in that I didn't fall asleep in. And he said, I'll take it. began a journey through that church and through those folks and through those relationships, and I threw it all away. Made all the mistakes you can make. See, when you are tempted and you are struggling and you, are, you don't have the tools, you succumb. I did. Viv called me up and asked me if I wanted to go to a youth convention. They were having Boyertown, Pennsylvania. A couple hours away, I said, anything to get out of this place and away from all these troubles. And I did. And there I went. And on the first night, they did the musical. And I did all the tech. And at the end of the musical, they had a place for testimonies. And it surprised everybody because I went up on the platform to testify. It wasn't really a testimony. It was a confession. I confessed how poorly I had made my life and decisions that I had made and the people that I had hurt. And I asked for forgiveness, and I told them that I was sorry. The next day, we went through all kinds of conferences. We built it all around the musical, tell it like it is. I found myself interested, engaged in ways I'd never been. That night, we came together for a service in that outdoor tabernacle. Horace Shepherd, some of you will know the name, preached. Dynamic preacher. Shep preached, and he preached on the subject, tell it like it is, and that's exactly what, it, what he did. He told it like it was. And at the end of it, he invited the first youth to come to the altar, to come shake his hand and come to the altar and accept Christ. And before he had the invitation out of his mouth, I had already stepped out into the aisle, did the 8Q dash in record time, <laughs> shook his hand, knelt at the altar, and began to weep. My best friend came over, put his arm around me, Shepherd came over, laid hands on my head, and prayed me into the kingdom. I knew no scripture at all at that point. If I had, I would have stood up and said, Behold, has passed away. Behold, everything has become new. I was changed in a way I couldn't describe, and in a way that has never left me from that moment. It's been, yes, it's been 53 years. And that moment is still so indelibly etched in my being that everything that I am changed at that moment. And everything I have become springs from that moment. 
I, uh, I experienced the 1970 revival at Asbury, not in Kentucky, but in New Jersey, at a Methodist church in a basement with words I didn't know and understand. But a year later, it culminated with a change in my life. And that intimacy that I experienced at that moment with God has forever stayed with me. For what I understand prayer to be is not words, but a relationship. It's not the formation of phrases, but it's the experience of being intimate with God. I know it is our habit to simply end at this chapel at the end of the preacher's message, but I've asked Mick if he'll come and just play, may sing. I just thought it, it was inappropriate to end this without giving you an opportunity, if you so chose, to come and pray. I know coming forward at an altar seems to be out of fashion these days as I've traveled around to churches. It's not often done and used. But then again, I'm so old, it doesn't matter to me anymore. But I thought maybe there were some who might just need to come and pray. We'll open this for a little while, for a few moments, or for whatever it is that you need. So if you are so inclined, come and pray. Lord, have your way. Have your way in here with us. You're already here. You were here before we ever arrived. And you are in us and leading us. Continue to do so. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.